Well, I, the thought occurred to me that what we hear about war is always different from the real thing that is experienced by people firsthand. And so those without this experience are also very vulnerable to being led by the nose, by those with an interest in the outcome of a war. During World War II, I was a child, basically six to 10 years old during Hitler's occupation of Hungary. The Budapest apartment house we lived in was bombed to the ground during the 1944-45 siege. My father was taken away by the Russian military. He didn't return for many months. My mother with three kids, then eight, six and a half year old, had to flee hoping someone would take us in a dozen times that winter. The front was at the Danube River and the village of Ivancha, less than a mile away where we were holed up trying to avoid the bombing of Budapest, changed hands between the Germans and the Red Army several times. I remember us kids building a bridge across a German army trench from a frozen carcass of a pig that Russian soldiers had used for target practice to the music of not too distant bombardment and machine gun fire. My mother, only 30 at that time and beautiful, did everything she could to look ugly and old to avoid being raped by marauding soldiers. We had no electricity for longer than a year. My third grade lasted only a month. We had no school books or writing paper. I never really studied fourth grade at all. I learned to siphon gasoline though from military vehicles, both Russian and German, and add a bit of sugar to it to make it safe to burn in a kerosene lamp without an explosion. I learned that soldiers are war victims, not heroes and that war crimes are always committed only by the enemy. People's humanity and dignity were always there too for those of us who cared to recognize it. Red Army Private Sergei Voskresensky set me at age eight on his lap and taught me the Cyrillic alphabet and how to say Lord have mercy in Russian. War also taught me that people on our side of a conflict, even one as complex as World War II, could live together in peace just fine, but for our so-called leaders. Decade later in 1956, when the Red Army attacked again to crush our popular uprising, I learned to make Molotov and how to does this bother you that these things come up? And how to walk up behind a tank idling on a city street, pour gasoline into its air intake, jump away and watch the innards and the occupants explode. By dis disabling the first and last vehicle, two guys could disable a whole convoy marooned in an urban setting because the tanks didn't have a room to maneuver. Then we would offer some fresh bread to the hungry, bewildered Russians trapped in the remainder of the convoy. Some of them didn't know where they were, as they are still have that same problem in, in the Ukraine. War also taught me to turn any hatred I may have been taught toward the designated enemy into anger or pity. These are sources of psychic energy I need to help rebuild after the various uniformed hordes have cleared out. Hatred in invariably produced by demagogic leaders only clouds the mind and depletes one's energy. So what, what motivates war makers? War profits, greed, ego, delusion, madness, can all motivate so-called leaders to send young people to battle other young people 
they never go themselves. In his 1961 farewell address, retiring President and General Eisenhower eloquently warned about the corrupting impact of the military industrial complex on US society. We are witnessing that daily and not only here in the United States. Powerful defense that is war industry actors, corporations, consultants, think tanks, retired military bass, all profit mightily from actual wars and from maintaining standing armies, military bases, weaponry, and related research development and intelligent activities. Their massive profits, courtesy of the taxpayer, allow them to lavishly support, in effect, pay off elected politicians who in turn make sure that the rest of the complex, the military industrial complex is well served and compensated. Militarism corrupts. International weapons marketing shows are facilitated by diplomatic missions of major powers around the world. The weapons sold have created an overarmed world where a skirmish or an outlier war can break out anywhere and whenever it does, regardless of the human suffering, the military industrial complex benefits financially. So as the hymn goes, the circle is unbroken as long as they buy and buy. Oil interests also profit mightily from war. The military is by far the largest consumer and waster of fossil fuels. And when gasoline prices rise due to war, opportunities are rife for fabulous profiteering, dutifully tolerated by a patriotic mass of their elected representatives. Elected representatives. I have learned not to trust anything that any uniform person says to me. Not because these people are certain to lie, but because they are required to uphold some official line regardless of the facts. When Mr. Laufer, our beloved village grocer, and his family and thousands of Hungary's Jewish and Roma citizens were marched off on the guard we were told they were needed as temporary labor by Germany's war industry. We all know where they actually ended up. Hitler's war dispatches regaled us with the German forces' victorious advances, even as those forces were beaten to pulp at the Battle of Stalingrad. Putin claims to fight Hitler-style Nazis and fascists in Ukraine. George W. Bush attacked Iraq because it had weapons of mass destruction that did not exist. Depending on the degree of authoritarianism, critics of this universally corrupt system can be severely punished. In Putin's Russia, you can get 15 years at hard labor for just saying war. That is, spreading fake news, where have I heard this phrase before, that deviates from the official narrative of special military operations. Even in democracies, people are often accused of being unpatriotic if they dare to question the official narrative. For all that, wars don't solve problems. More often, they create them. At a bare minimum, they set up unjustified or justified rather resentments that can spark the new conflict. Witness how war, World War II followed World War I. US wars of the last several decades have failed to solve any real problem. But when you only have a hammer, all problems tend to look like nails. Think war on terror, war on drugs, war in Afghanistan. Think Russia's war on Ukraine. 
the more authoritarian and more arm, armed, the less restrained, factual, factually informed and faithful to the truth Varta leaders become. And more apt to be surrounded by fawning yes men. Most wars begin with a call, liberating a country, restoring national greatness, defending natural, national interests, securing essential supplies, and all too often simply consolidating power at the expense of a scapegoated subpopulation. Adolf Hitler set out to advance the injustices of the peace accords at the end of World War I. To rise to power, he perpetrated a proxy attack on the Reichstag and successfully exploited long simmering, originally religion-based anti-Semitism, blaming the Jews for Germany's economic woes. From Kristallnacht, his war became a noble struggle to defend Deutschland über alles and racial purity. We know the rest of the story. The victims change, but the plot line remains. For Hitler, it's the Jews. For Trump, the criminal Latin Americans. For Putin, the Ukrainian Nazis. And of course, everybody fights for freedom, including the mob that attacked the US Capitol on January 6, 2021. Excuses are part of every war. A Soviet era joke made the rounds in Budapest back in the 1950s. It declared that the future is all set, only the past keeps changing. Official lies that a company abuses of power and war making consist of manufacturing, manufactured explanations to justify policies, including acts of war even at the price of rewriting history. Ukraine, a fertile land the size of Texas, is Europe's largest producer of wheat and corn, traditionally by thousands of family farms. In 1932, Soviet dictator Stalin forced collectivization of Ukrainian agriculture. He combined it with the forced removal of whatever was grown for distribution across an already famine-stricken Soviet Union. It caused mass starvation in Ukraine. Hundreds of thousands died. Not surprisingly then, when 19, in 1941, Hitler's armies attacked the Soviet Union, many surviving Ukrainians greeted them as liberators, only to see the Germans murder over a million Ukrainian Jews. In Putin's Russia, Stalin's crimes are systematically whitewashed and the Holocaust is not much mentioned. So without the historic context, Putin accuses Ukraine of being run by Nazis, using this as the pretext to liberate the Ukrainians. We have our defense department. Russia forbids calling Putin's special military operations a war. Russians who say otherwise are silenced and subject to sentences of up to 15 years at hard labor. Russia, Russia's independent media have now been shut down. Some leaders believe their own falsehoods, which is a problem in general, and can't imagine anyone doubting those. Misinformation is part of war and of permanent readiness for war, enforced by secrecy and the suppression of truth. A new wrinkle, of course, is the internet. Theoretically, it has the potential to undermine war makers' claims, including Putin's. His support within Russia could theoretically diminish. However, the internet is a double-edged sword. Falsehoods can be distributed and magnified just as easily. Conspiracy theories, in particular, tend to fill any vacuum 
of reliable information. Furthermore, conspiracy theorists, like all believers, are easily manipulated. The US too has been guilty of fighting wars of choice and attacking innocent civilians throughout its history. Examples abound, think Hiroshima. But Western war crimes do not in any way justify Putin's. Still, some conspiracy theorists make excuses for Putin. Takes Fox News' Tucker Carlson. In the run-up to Putin's invasion, he persistently downplayed the severity of the Russian threat. He called the situation a border dispute, distracting from the reality of Russia's year-long med years meddling in eastern Ukraine and Putin's illegal recognition of the Donbass's two separatist regions, the Donetsk and the Luhansk. Carlson said Ukraine was not a democracy. He even absurdly posited that somehow US Democrats with a capital D stand to benefit financially from a war there. And he delivered a long TV monologue about how Americans are socialized to hate an innocent Vladimir Putin. On March 10, Carson spent much of his long, hour long month program claiming that Biden, the Biden administration was funding secret bio labs in Ukraine and that the Pentagon lied about them. But Ukraine's bio facilities are not secret and have nothing to do with the production of biological weapons. For decades, the US has partnered with former republics of the Soviet Union to secure their biological weapons materials. The Cooperative Threat Reduction Program has existed since 1991, and it's not secret. In Ukraine too, the focus of, US, of the US's work was to consolidate leftover Soviet biomaterial bio into secure facilities. It is based on these facilities though, that Putin falsely alleged that the US is working with Ukraine to build biological weapons. And Tucker Carlson has identified this disinformation to his audience of millions, blaming who else, Biden. To understand Carlson's motivation, we must remember that his rhetoric is in service of his white nationalist, right-wing populist worldview and audience. He and his ideological allies like Stephen Bannon and Donald Trump see in Putin someone with a shared worldview, authoritarian, fiercely nationalistic, bigoted. They see themselves as part of a shared ideological project. Carlson's affection for Hungary's authoritarian leader, Viktor Orban, is an expression of international solidarity with right-wing elements abroad. The Russian government understands the value of Tucker. He is making many of their own false claims about the US repeating it. But these claims are far from more powerful coming from an American with a massive audience. So a March 3rd Kremlin memo directs the state owned media outlets to run clips from Tucker Carlson as often as possibly can. And this is said we're waiting. It is essential to use as much as possible fragments of broadcasts of the popular Fox News host, Tucker Carlson, who sharply criticizes the actions of the United States and NATO, their negative role in unleashing the conflict in Ukraine and the defiantly provocative behavior from the leadership of Western countries and NATO towards the Russian Federation and towards President Putin personally, unquote. The Russian government also praised Fox News, this coverage of the invasion of Ukraine. Quote, on only Fox News is trying to present some alternative points of view, unquote. This is from Russian 
Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov on March 18th. So how to respond to war? When directly affected by war, one obviously takes sides. What about when it's other people's war? Is taking sides then wise? Realistically, an individual citizen choosing a side makes little difference beyond the emotional satisfaction of the chooser. It does not impact the war or its outcome. However, people and institutions in position of influence should carefully weigh whether to publicly take a side. Third parties I'm talking about. Taking a side assumes that a collective stance United Front, join the impose sanctions, etc., can force desired change. But I think here is the rub. Is force effective? Can change be forced? Can force be applied without setting the stage for the next confrontation, even if our side prevails in this one? Think World Wars One and Two. Force begets force. Rational solutions to real problems are seldom affected by force, which reduces all participants to the lowest common denominator. Those who take sides forfeit the opportunity to make peace instead of perpetuating an ongoing series of violent application of force. Think of the US role in Israel versus occupied Palestine saga. From this vantage point, offering quiet, neutral diplomacy appears to be a wiser course of action for anyone with the stature and position of, the, of, of uh, influence. And the rest of us common folk, how effective have our protests, marches, and picketing been? How about sanctions, excuse me? The better thing to do is to cutting is cutting the feet from under modern warfare in general and in Putin's in particular. That is a speedier transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy. Energy is of key importance. Food is energy. Russia's and Ukraine's together produce about, about almost a third of the world's wheat and corn. Forecasts already warn about 20% rise in global food prices if the war prevents <clears throat> the planting of essential grains this spring. What will this do to North Africa and the world's poor? You, Egypt alone imports 70% of its wheat from Russia and Ukraine. <clears throat> and so do several other North American countries. What about Europe? Modern warfare would be physically impossible without fossil fuels. This fact is obvious. It requires <clears throat> no elaboration and plainly Russia's sales of oil and gas also finance Putin's war on Ukraine. Burning gas and oil is also the leading source of course, greenhouse gas emissions that overheat the planet, creating destructive forest fires, droughts, severe storms and flooding. It is making parts of the world unsustainable and uninhabitable the driving migration, destabilizing governments, and potentially sparking wars. Fossil, fossil fuel demands has turned Putin into a world power. Russia is the world's third leading oil producer and the second leading producer of national gas. Together, these two commodities account for the core of Russia's $1.5 trillion economy. Since the invasion of Ukraine, the US and Europe have heavily sanctioned Russia, isolating it from the world banking system, 
and inflicting real pain on ordinary people. But the energy sector was initially carved out of the sanction before because cutting off Russia's fuel export increases energy prices and drives up inflation. Plus, Europe depends on Russian gas for winter heating. So the world is still buying Russian oil and gas at nearly the same rate as before. Therefore, the best way to cut off Putin's war funds and power is to speed up the transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy. Yet, while families everywhere struggle to buy food, clothing, and gas as costs skyrocket, two dominant US interest groups salivated the profits prospects of Putin's brutal war even as it destroys Ukraine. The war industry, defense contractors see nothing but dollar signs. For war means huge profits for the military industrial complex that President Eisenhower has warned about. Indeed, Congress has just approved an astronomical three quarters of a trillion dollar Pentagon budget. Some have suggested that Russia's war in Ukraine justifies this big spending, but little of that funding will actually help Ukraine fight Russia in the coming weeks and months because much of it is for procurement of new warplanes and fight war, warships rather and fighter jets, think, things that take years to build. This budget contains billions of dollars for weapons the Pentagon didn't even ask for. Weapons industry lobbyists did. And they are about to get paid from taxpayer funds, handsomely as usual, by the politicians whose campaign war chest these lobbyists so lavishly enrich. Meanwhile, oil and gas industry giants too are working full furiously to profit off the current supply crunch and skyrocketing prices. Conveniently, the military happens to be the largest and least efficient consumer of fossil fuels. The American Petroleum Institute and Big Oil are lobbying Congress for new well-willing rights across the US. They say it is to make up for the global supply crunch and ease the pain average Americans feel at the pump. Funny though, how this also increases our dependency on the oil guys, making them obscene profits in the process. This is where I think peace action comes in. Our energy policies of the past have failed us. They have been disastrous to our national security and dev devastating to our planet. They propped up authoritarians, cover, covertly supported coups d'etat, and invaded other countries, all to secure our sources of oil. Even now, the US is tempted to double down on part of that failed strategy. To replace Russian oil in the global market, the administration is flirting with alternative oil authoritarians like Venezuela and Saudi Arabia. As long as we remain dependent on oil, we will have to depend on the handful of such authoritarians that control the wells, as well as the old companies that put profits over people and planet. We must use this moment to rapidly diversify our supply of energy and transition to greener, cleaner, renewable sources. This is the at once the path to peace, national security, energy independence, one strategic way to do it all. But how? Doing what we already know how to do. On main scale, for example, we know how to reduce the energy consumption of our buildings by as much as 90%. This is existing technology. Secondly, we, we know how to devise a comprehensive, integrated 21st century transportation system 
based on a distance-based hierarchy of transportation modes. What I mean is we should be walking up to three miles. We should take bicycling up to seven miles. Cars up to 20 miles. Why? Because even low cost golf cars would then do. Transit buses up to 25 miles, light rail up to 30 miles, moderate and high speed rail up to 1500 miles. And airplanes begins to make sense beyond that distance. In an efficient transportation system, these modes work together, each operating in its most efficient segment, providing the highest mobility for most people with the fewest delays and the lowest cost. Missing modes cause the remaining modes to overload and the system performance deteriorate. Of course, Maine no longer has light or commuter rail. In fact, but for Amtrak's downeaster, there is no passenger rail at all. Most of Maine relies on cars and for even mid-distance travel airplanes. No wonder half of Maine, Maine's 5 billion annual energy bill goes for transportation. But the investment in these changes, huge as it is, will, be, will pay for itself so any loan repayment, private, state, or federal, would be guaranteed by the energy cost savings, which are significant. Of course, I would settle for a good chunk of the bloated US military budget over a few years running to pay for it all. So this action for me is more than protests, pickets, or official sanctions. It is working on imaginative solutions on the world's most real, major real problems, and they're all related to energy. That's sort of what I wanted to say about war and what it makes me think of when I think war. Thanks for your attention. And whatever questions, comments, eggs to throw. <laughs> that was a wonderful talk. Um, and there's a lot there. Uh, any questions from our audience? Peter, did you unmute? Go ahead. I did. It was very complex and complete, uh, even to the finances. I don't know if the element of uh, Department of Defense audit was included. I think that would be a neat uh, aspect to consider that the Department of Defense's money and the funding, the budget has never been reconciled with an audit. It's just a means of keeping track of the money. That's, that's a problem. And, and that reminds me of other, other question that could be asked is when you talk about NATO, Obviously, NATO is right now a wonderful and useful thing. On the other hand, whenever a US president in the past has been going over uh, belly aching to the Europeans to spend more money, they were actually lobbying on behalf of the military industrial complex because all that money is going into their pockets. So we, we have a problem and, and, and the auditing would be very important, Peter. And uh, Dwight Eisenhower also said, I don't know if you quoted him, that every dollar spent on an airplane deprives the community of money for schooling and other programs. Yes, it, it was in that same, Farewell address, yes. Yeah. And, Thank you. and it's worth noting that Eisenhower was a Republican. There used to be, we used to have Republicans, let's remember that. The term changes over time. Yeah, I, 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 I suppose it's the term or, or is it the people? 
question. Um, could you say a little bit more about um, changing changing energy resources doesn't include or we frequently say that it does not include nuclear power could you say a little bit more about nuclear power the problem with new well, first of all when you look at the origins of nuclear power and i remember this personally as a teenager we they will be drawn down on both in the uh, Western broadcasts and in the Soviet broadcast about the need to have peaceful uses for nuclear. Why? Because we all had the bomb and they desperately tried to justify the existence of the bomb by saying that the research was really for peaceful uses. I never forget that, I never bought into it. I furthermore believe that the biggest problem with nuclear power, other than its huge expense, is the, is the waste. So two things, nuclear waste is an unsettled problem. All we do is, is pile it up somewhere and don't talk about it, but it's still there and it's still dangerous. The second thing is, if something really goes wrong, we have no control over it. We don't know how to do it. Think about Chernobyl, think about Fukushima. In other words, we are playing with a, and this is because it's nuclear fission. Now, if we had fusion, it would be a different story. But of course, we already have nuclear fusion. It's called the sun and it works. So I don't have, I'm saying this fully recognizing that much of the world is now powered by nuclear, but it is at best, at most we could say is the nuclear is, a, a, let's just say it's a transition, transitional energy source. France, Russia, Ukraine, much of Eastern Europe is powered by nuclear. Even Sweden has nuclear, even though they, they voted, that's interesting, they voted back in the 80s to get away with it from nuclear, but we still have it. So let's just say that we should get rid of nuclear as soon as we can because of those two things, the waste and the fact that we have absolutely no way to deal with the disaster. Also with the invasion into Ukraine, it's imminently obvious that there are actually targets. Yes, it's targets. really playing with fire. Yeah. I had a question that was mailed to us by somebody who isn't here, but she asks what a microgrid is. Okay. I'm, I'm glad you, you raised that question. Um, a power grid consists of a means of producing. So generation, like a generating plant, the distribution and the users. That's basically what considered a, a power grid, the wires between the users and, and so forth and the controls. A microgrid, as its name implies, is basically a, so, a smaller version of it. So uh, a very small microgrid would be if I have on, on my house um, a source of power, which would be, let's say, solar, solar panels, and I would have storage, and I would be able to, when the power goes down, I would be able to disconnect from the down main grid and still have power. So I would have my small microgrid. So a microgrid would be on the other hand. So this is the very smallest possible microgrid you can imagine. 
in, in Vermont, there is a very progressive utility, uh, an electric utility that is now creating its own microgrids in several towns. In fact, they are trying to decentralize in order to protect the the survivability of the of the of the big grid instead of having one big grid they would have smaller microgrids based on a town or based on a region so now you are talking about taking a whole existing um, circuit a, a sub let's say a substation anything that serves by that substation would now be made independently separable from the rest, rest of the grid. That would be a large version. Um, both of them are now possible. And in fact, they are being built. Of course, everything costs money, but the, the main advantage of microgrids obviously is that A, you can stay on, you can disconnect and stay on no matter what happens to the big grid. The implication of that obviously is that this is the way to create a much more survivable grid. You can sabotage one part and the other part is still on. You can have a big uh, storm, but the other part will uh, stay on happily. And you can also then reduce the need for more long distance supply. Right now we are very vulnerable because whatever, whatever the, all you have to do is take out the, the central power station and everything will go down. So I don't know if that made sense what I just said about yes, it. Yes. Microgrid is basically a smaller version of the regular grid that can be separated from the grid. That makes sense. The other night I understood the uh, state is looking at some of those farms that are now um, poisoned from the PFAS. So there's a lot of flat land that's gonna be wasted. And what they're proposing is that those farms would be a good place to start putting up some solar farms and connecting them into microgrids. and. That's what you're talking about. That's where the property is going to end up, I guess. <laughs> yes, but we have to be, we have to look at the, the, the whole picture here. I think we hate to talk about this, but the fact is that there is no way with our current demand that we can supply the world with solar or with renewables. The first thing that has to happen is a significant reduction of demand. In other words, well, it, again, on the scale of my house, it doesn't make any sense for me wasting energy, leaving all the lights on, uh, whatever you wanna call waste, and then try to put up enough solar power to, to to make, uh, make all the power because it's economically nonsense in, in, in a small scale. But it's also physically nonsense once you include the whole world in this thing. If we're gonna waste it, we simply don't have enough wherewithal, not just money. We, we don't have the enough technology, we don't have enough raw material, uh, you name it. We have to first, cut the unnecessary demand. And the other interesting potential that is coming down the pike is electric cars could be integral part of a microgrid. Uh, an electric car can just as easily be used as the battery of a house as it can, as the battery, as, as the house can provide its, its power for travel. In other words, when it just sits there, which as, as the average car statistically spends 90% of its time 
park. Nobody sits in the car more than 10% of the time, unless you're a cab driver or something like that, but, but you know, normal people don't. And so, so that means using that vehicle, 90% of the time when it's parked there, it can keep exchanging power between the grid and, and, the, and the, this is now coming into its own. It obviously requires enough car to make sense, sense to talk about it. Suzanne, any questions? Oh, you're muted. Elliot, any questions? I can ask you to unmute. Uh, oh, um, I, I saved an article for Paul. <laughs> and thanks, Paul, for being here. You're incredible. Uh, two women in Massachusetts, I don't know if you're, you're familiar with their names. Uh, they came up with a system in which you connect um, heat pumps. Mm -hmm. Um, are you familiar with that? Heat, let me see here. Connect heat um, pumps to what? Uh, to uh, the, 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 uh, the um, geothermal sources. Uh, let me see. Last month, after years of prodding state legislators, they approved 16 million project that uh, Margavi and Schulman proposed to demonstrate that there is a financially viable, techno technologically sound way to heat and cool the vast majority of the state's homes and businesses without fossil fuels. The project was linked, has, uh, uses linked heat pipes and subterranean pipes that can harness steady underground temperatures to heat and cool buildings. Are you familiar with that? I am familiar with the concept. Yes, I, 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 I didn't see this article in particular, but it is, it is uh, a, it's a non, no brainer. You, you basically, even in an unheated basement, you will find a, an insulated unheated basement. The chances are that there won't be any frost if the basement is deep, simply <clears throat> because the, just a few feet down already, there's a steady 55 degree temperature or thereabouts. <clears throat> so when we talk about geothermal, we don't have to think about, you know, the huge deep uh, wells that reach down into the core of the earth. What we are talking about is, is going down maybe 50 or 60 feet or spread around. It, it works fine. The question is how much it costs. I heat my house at this moment with heat pumps. They are not geothermal. They, they derived all their energy from the outdoor air. I have three heat pumps now, and I'm just installing the fourth. Two of those heat pumps that I have are taking sections of the house. That's because it's an old house and you have all these dug on rooms. If the house was open, you wouldn't need that many. So I have two heat pumps, one for downstairs, one for upstairs. And, and the, the third one will come in in a very few weeks to take an unheated section of the house. And the fourth heat pump heats my water. So even my hot water is being heated with heat pumps. It works fine. And the, 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 the best, the most important thing to remember about heat pumps is that it's efficient because the energy is used to drive a motor, an electric motor. The electric motor in turn drives a compressor. So rather than having heat like <laughs> like you have uh, resistance heat, in other words, rather than having, having um, <clears throat> like these baseboard heaters. Oh, oh. <laughs> lost the volume. Paul, can you unmute again? 
ask to unmute Martha. Uh, Paul. Oh, we can't hear you. Am I on now? Yes. yes thank yeah. you. <clears throat> so anyway, the efficiency of, uh, of the heat pump derives from the fact that, that driving a motor is much more efficient than using the uh, resistance of a wire that makes it hot. That's, that's where it, and, and the, these heat pumps are now getting even more and more efficient. I understand there's a call from um, one of the groups, I forget which one, that they're calling on the president to have put into motion the, some sort of wartime resolution that everyone can get a free heat pump installed in their home. <laughs> Peter, you have a question. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, will the grid be able to accommodate everyone on electric? And what well, do I do when the power goes out? The, the, the grid will accommodate everyone if we all conserve energy. The, the grid is having a hard time accommodating everyone because we waste so much. But my and, and the beginning of the waste, for example, when you live in a house that has been built, that has, <clears throat> you know, uh, six inches of insulation maximum, badly installed, and leaks like a sieve. I have I have done uh, about four hundred uh, energy audits before I aged out. And I can tell you that the average main house is hugely inefficient. And that's where our problem is. It doesn't even make sense to me to <clears throat> spend the money on a heat pump when I know that 80% of the heat will be dissipating out in the atmosphere. Why would I want to do that? On the other hand, why would I want to burn oil that way either? You see, that's where our problem, you have to come to terms with the fact, by the way, I just mentioned it, I just ran across a material that uh, two days ago, a, a, a Canadian material, it's a, it's a foam, um, all of us know what a foam board is, you know, a foam insulation. This one, however, is so such a dense foam that it can even hold a screw huh. and and it is made 100 percent from recycled pet the the, the kind of the, the, the uh, soda bottles and all that you can you can build a whole building huh. and you can see it in nobleboro there is a small beginning venture that called up box, up for opportunity, huh. up box. It's, it's right on route one in Nobleboro. And they, they have a house there, uh, just a small building that demonstrates the thing. This, it's, it's 100% recycled bottles. There is nothing else there. Even the exposed beams are made out of this material. Huh. I would love to see this material applied to the outside of existing houses and, and in, in, in effect putting a, uh, a sweater on the outside of the house and, and that would reduce thermal bridging to, to, through the studs. It would reduce, um, it would improve insulation and it would make the house tight. <clears throat> so, go ahead, Peter. Will these improvements to my house offset my change from uh, gas heat and my two Teslas charging outside? Uh, there, it sounds like there's going to be an increased demand if I go electric, no matter what I do. And you say if we all conserve, the grid well, can if, accommodate. If you reduce, well, 
your house. I know that I can reduce my house and therefore I know you can reduce yours too unless it's a historic building and you can't touch it. Okay, that's <clears throat> another story. But a normal house, we can all reduce <clears throat> the energy consumption up to 90 degree, 90%. So if you cut your consumption by 90%, that's when you become financially sensible by in, in, in you know, putting in whatever heating system, you're gonna come out ahead. Okay, Even but if that... you put in oil, you're gonna burn. So instead of a $4,000 uh, uh, heating bill, you will have a $400 heating bill. That's what it does. And we can all do that, but it costs money. So what we would need is a program, and I'm talking with a banker because he happens to live across the street. And I'm saying, can we create a loan where I can, <clears throat> say it costs $100,000. So I, I, I borrow $100,000, fix up my house and save 90% of my heating. So if, if I can save um, $3,000 a year because I improved my house, and if the loan is, it allows me to pay out of my saving. In other words, give me a loan, not based on my income and not based on the value of my house, based on the value of what I can save. And if you allow me to re repay that, <clears throat> we could all afford to do that. But the banker would say, well, you know, but that, that's, that's so unusual. We don't do that. Well, that's the problem. But there is no reason why we couldn't do it. In other words, let's get real. We, we need to do things differently. That's the, that's the issue. Or else we're always always going to have wars and, and whatnot. So, on that note, I think we're reached our closing time. It looks like Suzanne's raising her hand. Yes, there's just one thing. I think it would take you pages to respond to this, Paul. But uh, what is the future of the Republican Party when it bans books, it bans speech, and so forth and so on? One word. <laughs> <laughs> Think of the medieval church. I think of Taliban. <laughs> yeah, the Taliban or the medieval church. Or we, if, if you're going to go back in the Middle Ages, which is what they are doing, book burning and this and that. I don't know where this is going to lead. What worries me more is what is the future of this country? If right. we are not doing anything about this is a political party, let me out. I mean, this is a serious problem yeah. and we are not ad addressing it. Exactly, exactly. Sadly, but but uh, do we want to push him? <laughs> president, you know. Well, we had a Trump. <laughs> well, we have a Trump, but we don't, we don't have it, him as a president. We might end up with him again if we are stupid enough. But oh. Or Ted Cruz. Yeah, Lord. Well, on that point, I really appreciated your, your discussion today, and I learned a lot, and um, we hope to talk again soon. And thank you for the opportunity. You guys Bye. have fun. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Stop recording. Stop.